Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so I think we're ready to start. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, Vikram Adve, who is visiting us. He is, uh, he is a professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and is currently visiting EPFL on uh, his sabbatical. Vikram, of course, uh, needs no introduction, right? We, together with uh, Chris Latner, his student, he developed the LLVM compiler infrastructure, which is now taken over the world and it's used by everybody in the planet for loads of great things. And he's going to tell us about some of those things, I think. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Yeah, so it's, it's great to be here. It's my first time in Cambridge. Um, I was telling Miguel that th this is one of the few places, this and MSR Redmond is one of, the few, uh, one of the few places where there are so many programming language, software engineering kinds of people that you could fill a whole academic department with just these kinds of people. It just doesn't uh, happen in any of the universities that I visited. Anyway, so I'm going to talk about a broad sort of a, a project with multiple facets that we call virtual instruction set computing and it's joint work with a number of people but I'll just call out a couple of them and I hope my pointer works, yeah. So John Criswell did the security uh, work on secure virtual architecture and he's now an assistant professor at the University of Rochester uh, continuing to work on, on security from both programming language and uh, operating system points of view. Chris Latner, of, of course, led the LLVM work and is, has been at Apple for many years. And uh, Swaroop Sahu, uh, who got his PhD in 2012 and is now a postdoc in my group, did the work on automated bug diagnosis, which I'll talk about in more detail today. Um, so as I'm sure you all know, the way that static languages, the classical C, C++, Fortran, uh, these kinds of languages have been compiled, that the compilation model for them has pretty much stayed unchanged since the earliest days of, com of compilers. And so, for example, so essentially in, in all these cases, a front-end compiler generates either uh, binary code. So traditionally, they would generate binary code for each file, which would be linked and then executed. Um, more modern compilers uh, now add an optional interprocedural optimization pass where individual files might be exported in IR form, linked in IR form so that you can do cross-module optimization and then you run it through a static code generator and then that code is shipped and executed. But the common point here is that in all cases, what you're shipping is native binary code and that's the part that's remained unchanged for the longest time um, since the earliest compilers. And even modern languages like Rust do essentially this. But an alternative model that is actually quite widely used today is what we call virtual instruction set computing. So the term may be new, but the concept is not at all new. But the idea is that instead of shipping native binary code, you ship some richer representation of software, a, a virtual instruction set of some kind. And then you translate that virtual instruction set to the native code for the target machine on the end user's machine or, or once you know what end, end user's machine you're running on. And um, you can is generate code offline, you can generate code online uh, using a just-in-time compiler. You can use profile information from end user executions, which are much more representative than some generic profile gathering to do uh, runtime optimization. In, in theory, you could even use those profiles to do optimization between runs on the end user's machine. I don't know of any system that actually does that, but it seems perfectly possible and it's a matter of, engin uh, of engineering. And uh, the point is that in all these cases, by shipping a richer representation, you can do sophisticated analysis and transforms on that end user machine. And um, the point, so the point here is that the virtual ISA is what enables these analyses and transforms. And so the, uh, informally, we define virtual instruction set computing as any case where the software ISA, the ISA that's used to ship the software, differs from the target machine ISA. And I'm sure many of you know uh, important examples of this that are widely used today. 
Can anyone think of one? Yeah, JVM.NET, <laughs> these are all examples of uh, shipping a, a rich virtual instruction set, right? In fact, this idea goes back to uh, early Lisp compilers which shipped a form of bytecode. IBM really took this to, uh, uh, to an extreme. They had a, a, a machine instruction set for their early um, mainframe series, the System 38 and later the AS400 and others, that was so rich that it, it included operating system primitives, database primitives, things like that in the virtual instruction set. But that has been, they, they maintain compatibility for 50 years of hardware on that virtual instruction set. It's quite remarkable. Um, it's not, mainframes are, are expensive machines, but much more popular systems today are things like JVM and .NET, which broadly focus on portability and type safety. But scripting languages are another good example because there you're shipping the source code itself. That's a much richer representation, right? So, so it's, a, it's a very good example. Another one that's coming, that's becoming more popular today are GPU compute environments. So for example, for CUDA, the code that's shipped is typically PTX code and PTX is, gives you portability across different GPUs in a particular GPU family. So in a sense, in any language, you can ship the source code itself. Yes, in any language you can ship, show, you can ship source code, but as a practical matter, it's very difficult to do that for languages like C, C++, Fortran, and so on, because then you'd have to ship all the header files and you'd have to ship all of the make files in the build environment that makes it possible to actually link them together. So languages like Java and others define dynamic class loading, which gives you a way to ship separate modules and link them as the program runs. But other languages typically don't include that kind of infrastructure. Yeah. So shipping source is not straightforward. At some, some level, that, that problem of the make files and the header files, something equivalent to that must show up at... Yeah, you know, if you had something like that, you could, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> so this is not a new idea, but the point I wanted to make is that there are two, at least two important classes of software that don't use virtual instruction sets, and perhaps they should. So the first one is high-performance software. So things like HPC applications for supercomputers, but many other uh, contexts, so media, uh, software, game engines, financial software, CAD tools, even web browsers, database systems, many, many libraries, high performance libraries are essentially all written in static languages and shipped as native binary code. An even more pervasive example is system software. So operating systems, hypervisors, daemons, um, cryptographic libraries, things like that are essentially all written in static languages and shipped as native binary code, okay? So what's wrong with this? Well, so there's nothing inherently wrong with this. It's just not as good as it could be is, is what we believe. So first, modern hardware architectures are really no longer a good match for this model because of increasing diversity. So for example, uh, memory hierarchies have been, have been pretty diverse now for the last probably 20 years or so. Uh, what's getting even worse now is vector instruction sets. Vector instruction sets with different vector lengths and alignment requirements and instruction uh, features and things like that make it very difficult to generate really good quality vector code for all the different possible variants of a particular processor family. Um, another example which is surprisingly common is that on mobile phones and tablets, the application processor has a number of accelerators on it but different mobile phones, let's say in a single family like Android or Windows or Windows Mobile or uh, uh, iOS, have different configurations of all those accelerators. And so if you want to write an app that's portable across all this hardware, it's very difficult to use the accelerators for application specific code. So the accelerators tend to be used by apps only for generic things that come with portable library interfaces. And otherwise, they only use the host CPU. So for example, in Android, they use uh, J, uh, Dalvik or Art, effectively a Java variant, to get portability across different host CPUs. Okay. And so portability across heterogeneous processors, SOC, which are basically all SOCs these days, is a very difficult problem. And so what you really would like to be able to do is to adapt software using a compiler analysis and transformations to the end user, to the specific end user device on which you're running. Another uh, problem is the nature of modern software. So modern software increasingly uses, of course, dynamic libraries that's been there for quite a long time, 
but also user loaded uh, software extensions. And these kinds of software extensions like in a web browser or in a database system and many others are effectively components that get assembled into the executing application only on the end user's machine. And so these are really barriers to analysis and optimization. Um, there are many other contexts in which this kind of, in which modern software would really benefit from being able to do better analysis and transformation on the end user's machine. I'm going to skip through some of these motivations here just in the interest of time. But the third category are security challenges. So I'll just give a couple of examples here. But uh, for example, browsers these days are almost uh, universally add browser extensions which run in the context of a browser and have full access to browser state. And you really need to be able to sandbox the browser extensions. Also, um, Cloud computing is a very, it's not actually on the slide, but in the cloud computing environment, anyone who wants to run their applications in the cloud has to trust the provider of the cloud infrastructure as well as all the software layers underlying the application. In all these contexts, you're effectively running uh, untrusted software in some form. You're either running untrusted software in a trusted context or trusted software in an untrusted context. And if you could do richer analysis and transformations on the end user system, you could do, you could benefit from significantly better security solutions. And I'll give you a couple of examples of this. So the bottom line in all these cases is that we'd like to be able to do richer analysis, rich analyses and transformations on the end user system. And a natural question that, that you might ask and you should ask is, can we not do this on machine code? Yeah, well, can we not do this on well, JVM, you're already doing it. I'm talking about native languages where you don't have a virtual instruction set. Because operating systems and browsers and things like that are typically not written. So they're written in C and C++. And there you don't have. You basically get native, only so native so binary code. This is a legacy problem, that if we would just rewrote everything in Java, <laughs> <laughs> okay. if it was, yes, if you could get rid of C and C++ and Fortran and Rust. So even more new languages like Rust, which, was, which has been explicitly designed to write system code um, is shipped as native binary code. Okay, so, so can you encapsulate what, what these, you know, what the virtual machines that are widely, virtual instructions that are widely distributed already, what don't they do? I mean, I, well, what they don't do, enough, yes, what they don't do is support the two classes of software that I was talking about. So HPC applications are rarely ever written in uh, managed languages. Because not fast enough, okay, exactly. So this is and portability plus speed. Uh, security and speed, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And actually also reliability. So I'll give you some examples of how automated debugging can get, get much better mm -hmm. if you were shipping virtual instruction set code. Okay. Yeah, you, you can do analysis on machine code. On machine code, absolutely. I just retired from working in a company that did it yes. in order to do reversible debugging. Yes, oh, and there's lots of examples of machine code analysis. There's, there's commercial tools, there's research tools, there's actually some very strong tools within Microsoft that do this. Yeah, we use the, the adjusting type translator, so we take machine code, okay. and translate yeah. it into something slightly different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you can lift it. And in fact, the point here I want, that I want to make here is that anytime you do these kinds of analyses or transformations or whatever, you are constrained by some, some uh, fixed budget of time and compute resources. And so the problem is that if you start with native machine code, all of the tools today spend a large part of that budget trying to lift the machine code up to a higher level mm -hmm. that gets enough information to do better uh, than what you could just do with the machine code itself. So I'll call it quote unquote a compiler IR, whatever that representation or information happens to be. And then you're only left with a part of the budget to do the remaining analysis and transformation. Whereas if you start with a compiler IR in the first place, you can use all of your budget to do those analyses and transformations. And that's a significant difference. It really does make a big difference in practice. But it's even worse than this because in practice, the kind of information that you can extract from the compiler IR is significantly more limited than what you get with a true compiler IR or something that came from source code. And that's, so there's a, there's a number of reasons for this. The instruction set semantics of modern architectures is really so complex that it's very difficult to reconstruct information. For x86, it's even difficult to distinguish data, embedded data from code, inst from instructions in the code segment. 
So even constructing a control flow graph, a precise, a reasonably precise control flow graph is very difficult for x86. And so for example, commercial tools like PIN from Intel don't even try to do static analyses. They basically are designed to do dynamic techniques where they construct the control flow graph dynamically by observing the behavior of the program. Uh, the memory model is extremely low level for native machine code. And effectively, all you know is that you have a, an array of bytes and, and you have to distinguish data types and, and code instructions and all of these things. It's very difficult to reconstruct higher level types from that. So there's a number of reasons why this compiler IR in quotes here is really not at all close to a, compiler, to a real compiler IR. So you're quite limited in terms of what you can do. Now, in practice, I think it will always be the case that some binary analysis will be essential if you want to do anything for a whole program. Um, but the point we, I want to make here is that we really need to try to minimize this as much as possible. And so in a sense, the, the, the argument I'm trying to make is that to the extent possible, all future software really should ship in a virtual instruction set form. And um, it, I'm not we need a universal virtual instruction set. Different systems, for example, uh, Android versus uh, Windows versus Linux could define different virtual instruction sets. It really, def you know, the, the environment or the set of systems that use a common virtual instruction set depends on many factors. But as long as you have a, a good, well-designed virtual instruction set for analysis and transformation, you can get quite significant advantages. And um, I'll try to make a case that the security benefits can be quite strong for doing something like this. The, um, there are no inherent performance penalties. So one common misconception is that you have to use just-in-time compilers. But you don't. In fact, um, in our system, we use static code generation, offline code generation, that is exactly the same quality in terms of the techniques as uh, before shipping the code. Time. Except it's that install time, yeah. And so you actually have more information on the end user system because you know the exact system that you're compiling for. So in that sense, just-in-time optimization should be an opportunity, not uh, a cost, yeah? What about performance in terms of battery use on the devices? Well, so if you have a battery-constrained device, there are other ways in which you could and should do this. For example, you could, if you were downloading an app from the Google Play Store for uh, the corresponding thing on Windows or Apple, you could do it on the server side. You don't have to do it on the end user device. Or you could only, you could defer doing it until the device is plugged in or something like that. And I guess the other, the other dimension is to do with the invertibility of, of compilation for debugging purposes and traceability and profiling and that doing, doing the compilation on the target device tends to make it difficult to trace, you know, to keep the information that allows you to invert compilation. Um, uh, so the, are you saying the, it makes the, it? The debug mapping, the maps or the, uh, the, the, all the, all the information the compiler needs to trace back to the source code in a, yeah. Reliable form. Why is that any more difficult? Fundamentally, you're just, all you're doing is, if you think of the compiler pipeline, you're effectively taking the, the last stage, the, the very back end, and just doing it a little later. So it's more difficult because the information, the residues from compilation need to be stored on the device. And if something goes wrong, like a crash dump, yeah. those residues have to be sent back as part of the crash dump. And so the, the cost of sending the inversion back to the original developer well, is increased because because you because the final code generation the map from the compiler ir down to the native code happens only in the end user's machine and not in the developer's machine yes and so you would have to send additional map information back but in fact i will i'm going to spend some time on uh, the debugging benefits that you get from being able to ship a virtual ISA like this. And I think that they greatly outweigh this kind of, uh, of drawback. Okay. Okay. The third point I want to make, which hopefully will, this actually I'm not sure I really need to make any arguments for this, but I think it's pretty clear at this point that it is, it is technically feasible and commercially acceptable to be shipping virtual instruction sets because they're already used quite uh, pervasively in, in many contexts, but just not all. 
Okay, so as a quick example, I'm going to describe the LLVM compiler system which we built in my group, which is an example of a virtual instruction set. It's not by any means the only one, but, um, uh, and I'm not going to expect you to read through all the details on the slide. The main, a couple of main points I want to make here is that uh, the LLVM IR, which is the code that's shown on the box on the right here, is the compiler IR, and it, but it is also a fully self-contained virtual instruction set in the sense that you can ship programs in this representation and execute them later on. And moreover, this representation is rich enough to do so quite sophisticated language independent compiler techniques. So it includes, it's a simple three address IR, it's architecture neutral and language neutral. It includes a full explicit control flow graph. So you don't even have to re reconstruct the graph. You, effectively, it, it just comes with the code. Moreover, all the instructions are always in static single assignment form. And SSA is a relatively uh, widely used data flow representation that enables a number of different, um, it, it, it makes it possible to, to do a number of different data flow analyses and transformations much more efficiently than traditional data flow techniques. And uh, I said we have type memory and registers. This is really a, a weak type system because it's capable of representing arbitrary C code, for example, and even allows external assembly. But it does have some information about types, including things like, for example, if you have an array with an array reference, the array indexing operation is explicit in the instruction set. So you're calculating the array index and, and uh, that allows you to do array dependence analysis and pointer analysis much better than if you didn't have that kind of information. Um, so that's the LLVM IR and the LLVM compilation model is quite close to the virtual instruction set uh, computing model that I described earlier. Um, you can, so front ends can generate LLVM which can be linked and optimized and then a static code generator can generate native machine code just like a standard compiler does. But you can also ship LLVM bit code and then compile it at install time or using just in time code generation. And you can further optimize it later on. Moreover, people have built experimental uh, run, managed runtimes for both JVM and .NET by translating the byte code to LLVM bit code and then using the LLVM JIT for code generation. So all of these capabilities uh, already exist in the LLVM infrastructure. And um, LLVM has seen pretty good success, as Miguel said, but in fact, most of the users of the commercial users of LLVM, like for example, all of Apple's compilers now on iOS and, uh, and Mac OS are, are based on LLVM. Um, but most of the commercial users, including Apple's, are effectively not WISC in the sense that they're all basically doing static uh, ahead of time techniques on the developer's end. Um, they use compile time and link time techniques. So Apple, Cray, and many others uh, do this. Google has a number of dynamic tools for, for error checking that do this. There are a few examples of WISC systems that use LLVM. I'm talking about, so these are commercial systems. So for example, Mac OS does it for graphics and CUDA, OpenCL and RenderScript all do it for GPU compute. Um, Google uses it in an interesting context for, uh, for browser extensions, which I'll describe just briefly in, in a minute. But uh, these are quite narrow contexts. And I think there are many other contexts in which you could use LLVM for virtual instruction set computing. Um, so, I think the, the main point here is that it does give you a, re, a reasonably good starting point for building and exploring these kinds of systems. So in the rest of the talk, I'm just going to very briefly talk about some of the security benefits of WISC using two examples, a commercial example from Google's portable native client and a research project in my group called Secure Virtual Architecture. Um, and then I'll spend a little bit more time on automated debugging and how that could benefit from by shipping a virtual instruction set. Um, I, we'll see how much time I get really to spend on that. And then we have some, our ongoing work is focusing a lot on performance and portability. But I really just have one slide on that and then a discussion slide. Okay. okay. So by the way, please, please feel free to uh, stop and ask me questions if you have any. Uh, and this would be a good time because I'm going to transition now to talking about some very specific stuff. So let's just quickly talk about uh, the security benefits here. So 
the first one here is the a system from Google called Portable Native Client, which is used in the Chrome browser to ship untrusted browser extensions. So typically such extensions have been either written in a type safe language or they don't have um, any, uh, don't have sufficient security uh, guarantees. Google wanted to enable people to write browser extensions in C and C++. So to get the performance benefits of writing code that way and shipping native code, but still to enforce the security of the, uh, the security constraints of the browser. And in order to do that, what they did is, uh, well, they first uh, uh, tried to do this by shipping x86 code, but, and then using the segmenting system in x86, but that was just not portable. It doesn't exist in, in 64-bit uh, x86 architectures. It doesn't exist on ARM. So then they ship, they moved to shipping LLVM bit code instead. And they basically define a restricted subset of C and C++ that, uh, developers can use to write browser extensions and then a standard front end will ship LLVM bit code which is then translated within the browser itself into native code and that the, all of this is actually untrusted but then a verifier running on the native code checks a set of security invariants that must be enforced on the browser extensions. And there are two advantages here. One of them compared with shipping native code. One of them is that the static code generator is in their control. So they can enforce things like alignment of instructions um, to prevent jumps into to arbitrary points in the code and a number of other such invariants on the generated code, which makes the, uh, both it makes the verifier's job easier and makes the performance of the generated code better. Uh, the second advantage is they get portability. So, so by doing this, they could relatively easily port to uh, the variants of x86 and to ARM. LLVM bit code is just a serialized form of LLVM, is it? Correct, exactly. Called bit code so we call it bit code instead of byte code because we shifted from using a byte level representation to a bit granularity representation. So it's instructions, more tightly it's more tightly packed, that's all it is, yes. Yeah. But the, ver the verifier in this thing, ignores the fact that it started as LLVM. It just takes the native code and re exactly. it, does it? I believe so. I don't know if it takes an advantage. So it certainly takes advantage of the restrictions that were imposed on the C, C++ front end, but it doesn't trust them. So it has to verify that those uh, requirements were also. advantage of all the high level information that would come with the LLVM bit code, right? Because no, it doesn't it. need to. It doesn't do that, but it... Um, I mean, you were arguing earlier that yes, it's, yes, it's, yes. you know, use up your budget reconstructing some right, high level right, stuff. And, right. And in this case, they don't need to do that because uh, in a sense, all they're doing in this verifier is enforcing a relatively limited security property, which is basically software fault isolation, which requires the, so for example, they do require constraints on the, on all the loads in store, loads in stores but they can enforce that on the native machine code itself. So you're correct, this is not, this is only taking limited advantage of the virtual instruction set here, and it's not for the security, it's really more for the portability okay. and simple, and it does speed up the code generated by the, for the extensions. Any other questions? Okay, so that's, a, that's one commercial example of, of a system like this. The second one is a research example, which is a project called Secure Virtual Architecture, um, which, has been used for a number of different kinds of security solutions. The goal of the SVA project was to explore what kinds of security benefits you'd get for operating systems if you could write and ship a whole OS in a virtual instruction set. Now, I'm not talking about uh, operating systems that are written using a safe language like Singularity or Java OS or a number of other systems like this that have been written to take advantage of safe programming languages. I'm talking about commodity systems like Linux and FreeBSD and others, which are written in C and C++. So uh, in, in traditional use, they do not get any of the benefits of a virtual instruction set. Okay. And the way we did this was to extend LLVM with a few operations. In fact, on the order of about, I think, 30 or so operations that uh, effectively look like an API. So, so they're implemented as a library and they provide the kind of interactions or, or privileged operations that an operating system needs from hardware in order to, uh, in order to work. And 
so effectively the virtual ISA here is an extension of LLVM with these operations which we call SVAOS. So uh, the, op the kernel itself is compiled into LLVM bit code form and uh, the SVOS provides the runtime operations that the kernel needs. SVOS is implemented as a library which is linked directly into the kernel. So these are not hypercalls. It's different from a hypervisor model where you're doing calling a higher privilege layer. The library runs at the same priv hardware privilege level as the rest of the kernel. And the translation of this LLVM bit code can happen at install time, it can happen while booting, it can happen at runtime using a JIT. We've built both install time and just in time um, engines for booting and running a kernel. But in practice for all our experiments, we just do it at install time because as, at least so far we've not specifically made any use of the just in time uh, translator. So that's a high level overview of SVA OS and uh, I'm sorry of SVA. And just to give you an idea of what the SVOS API is like, these are a few examples of the kinds of operations it provides. There's actually nothing terribly novel here. Um, this layer is sort of like the hardware abstraction layer in Windows or other operating systems have also used a lower level abstraction layer of the hardware that to which the operating system gets ported. And um, so we provide things like, uh, function calls to register interrupts and trap handlers to update page mappings in the uh, hardware page tables uh, to, I'm sorry, in, in the operating system page table. So the page tables themselves are managed by the SVOS library um, to do IO. Context switching is an important one. So for some of the security solutions, it's very, in fact, for all of them pretty much, you need to be able to protect the saved state of a thread and not allow the OS to be able to scribble on it if you want to make the OS untrusted. And uh, so when we swap the state of a thread, we save it into protected memory within the SVOS library and only return an opaque handle to the operating system. So the OS can say I want to make, it can request changes to a particular bag of saved state using other operations, but uh, it cannot directly write into those, into the fields of the saved state, like the program counter or the stack pointer or other things like that. For signal delivery, for example, you cannot just arbitrarily allow the OS to um, manipulate saved state of users, of user processes. Um, and I'll give an example of why this can be important. But so even, si so signal delivery, for example, happens through an API function here. Um, and similarly, any changes that you want to make to the, to the saved state of a process. So these are all effectively uh, library functions. And in practice, the way you'd use this is that you would port a kernel to this API, just like porting to a new architecture, except that it happens to be a virtual architecture. So in fact, in practice, it's a lot simpler. And once you do this, then the kernel itself will have no assembly code in it. All the assembly code is actually encapsulated in the implementation of the SVOS library functions. And moreover, all the interactions with the hardware happen in terms of these operations that the compiler understands. So you have a little abstraction of how the OS is manipulating hardware state and program state, which didn't exist before. And this allows better analysis of uh, kernel behavior. Um, and so this is how we ported, I say we, but that's sort of a royal we. This is, so John Criswell did this work for his PhD thesis and he ported both the, uh, the Linux kernel and the FreeBSD kernel to SVOS. Um, and just to give a sense of how, what the impact is on the trusted computing base, for the Linux kernel, um, most of the changes happen to the architecture dependent code. In fact, if you look at the lines that were modified, there were about 300 architecture independent lines modified, but those were essentially all for a particular security policy. They weren't actually necessary for using SVA, just, just plain old SVA. This was for memory safety in particular. Essentially all the changes for S to, to use SVA happen on the architecture dependent side. 
and they amount to a little less than 5,000 lines of code. And that compares to a few hundred thousand lines of code in the overall kernel. So the piece of code that you would be trusting for a particular security policy would be much less than the whole, than the original kernel. So uh, SVA, so, so one question you, should, you might want to ask is what, what is the benefit of SVA? What uh, advantages does it give? I think what's important about SVA is it gives you a unique combination that I don't think any other system has that I know of at least. First, it gives you rich compiler capabilities similar to not quite as strong as but quite close to what you can get with the JVM or .NET because you have a full compiler IR representation of the, of the operating system and better abstractions of the hardware interactions. In addition to that, you also get the ability to supervise OS behavior like a hypervisor does. Because the SVOS library, even though it's not a higher level of privilege, it's logically at the same level as a hypervisor. It's observing all the manipulations. So for example, making changes to page tables can be fully interposed on by the SVOS library. And in fact, that's a crucial part of all the security policies that we've been, able, that we've been imposed. And that combination of the hypervisor-like monitoring capabilities and the compiler techniques is what's unique here. And you can use this, sorry, does someone have a question? What does rich compiler capabilities mean here? Are Meaning you that you that can do stuff? much better, more precise analyses and transformations than you could do just on native machine code. So if I was compiling FreeBSD for a particular architecture, mm -hmm. the compiler is going to do that. Oh, uh, going to do, you know, going to optimize the, the, the operating system code anyway. You're going to so optimize it anyway, yes. But what I'm saying is if you just get, if, if you generate, Translate FreeBSD down to native code and ship that, and then give that to SVA. Now, the compiler techniques in SVA are m more limited because you're having to do any kind of analysis or transformations on native machine code rather than the, comp the virtual instruction set representation. And so, for example, I'll give you, so memory safety was one of the properties we enforced, and I'll come back to that in a second, but for memory safety, we do a number of fairly rich compiler analysis. We do pointer analysis, we do um, a form of escape analysis, we construct the call graph, and these kinds of analyses are quite imprecise when, if you try to apply them to native machine code, but can be much more precise here. And that precision leads to significantly lower overheads. But if you did that analysis when you were compiling your FreeBSD operating system in the first place, yes. you do that, and presumably people do. Of course, yes, you could do you that. Do it on the receiving end. You can do it on the receiving end, but if you did it on the sending end, if you did it ahead of time, yeah. then it, you'd have to either trust somehow that the, the binary code and preserves all the security policies that were enforced and the, uh, on the developer's end by the front end compiler, uh, or you have to be able to add proofs that can be certified right. on so the receiving trust. end. So it's a trust issue, absolutely. So you're yeah. saying if I build your FreeBSD free, free, free system and you install it, you have to trust me. <coughs> I have to either trust you or I have to verify all the oh, yeah. checks. Oh, yes, exactly. Uh, and you're saying, no, 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 if you run this, um, if I ship you the LLVM code, Correct. then you can check locally. Correct, right. exactly, yeah. Okay. We can apply all these techniques at the end user machine, yes. So operating systems, uh, you know, there are sufficiently few of them mm -hmm. And the you know the purve purveyors are sufficiently trustworthy. We might think the trust was less of an issue than with say you know some random little app. Well, but, it's not so much trusting the developers; it's uh, really trusting against compromises, against exploits. All it's all the bugs things. that might happen, the, mm -hmm. the exploits that might happen. And so, for example, if you go back and look at the reported exploits, the CVEs for Windows, uh -huh. for Windows 8, I think it was, in the last six months there are multiple screenfuls of them. We basically were looking through that list and there's a quite large number of them that can lead to a full compromise of the operating okay, system. But were they to do with somebody messing with the bits between Microsoft and the being installed on your machine? Well... The, you know, the attacker in the middle, which is what you were describing. No, no, so remember that what we're trying to do here is to prevent compromises of the operating system from violating any of our security policies. Yeah. 
if you, uh, so sorry, at the end of the day, that's our goal. Now, you're right that you could either do that ahead of time with ahead of time techniques, but then you'd have to verify them on the end user's machine. And there, the only, there the additional thing you have to worry about, as you say, is some kind of man in the middle attack on the bits as they're being shipped. Yes. But, um, but does that happen with, when you, that, you know, uh, there's no need for, so I think a, it's a chicken and egg thing, well, like all secure. <laughs> all these CVEs you're describing, the screen films. Oh, of course not. How many of them are to do with man in the middle attacks? Right, none. But, oh. but remember, that's a fundamental, that's like a standard sort of chicken and egg problem with security that if there are easy ways to attack a system, people are not going to go to great lengths to find some complicated way because today they don't have to do that man in the middle attack. They can just go attack Windows directly. If you made Windows more secure by doing ahead of time techniques, now you'd have to worry about more sophisticated attacks because the attackers would be forced to do that. And so really what you're trying to do here is to provide a security solution that's as secure as possible. That's really what it is. Yeah. I don't understand yeah. why this makes any progress. Um, makes any progress relative to current well, systems? That's security, right? If, if, so so if, I want to, if I want to be guaranteed that the what Windows that I'm running is the Windows that Microsoft shipped, yeah. I can just check the certificate, right? I mean, I just, it's, a secure, it's, it's securely signed. If I want, yeah. I can turn on the TPM stuff that ensures that I only boot signed images, and I'm done. I don't need to worry about where it, the bits got compiled. So this is also, you're right about that. So, so effectively, you could, Microsoft's compilers, ahead of time compilers, could perform all the, the compiler techniques that we use for our security policies, and then you could ship that binary code with a certificate and just check the certificate on the end user's machine. That's absolutely true. Yes, you could do that, yeah. yeah. And there you're effectively using the certificate as a way to uh, yeah. To check and the bits and to preserve the. the once, well, than yes. Times. Um, yeah. Much more expensive analyses. Yes. Hundred million times more expensive analyses. Yes. <laughs> the problem is that Microsoft don't actually do that. Oh well. <laughs> <So now> Microsoft <laughs> chip code yeah. that does contain opportunities for exploits, <laughs> and what his solution is going to do is to catch those exploits on the target machine. Well, those well, he's well looking that's a very strong <laughs> statement that we should discuss. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Microsoft spends hundreds of millions of dollars a year on analysis, both static and dynamic, to try and prevent security vulnerabilities. Right. And in fact, I think it's true that for an organization with the kind of with deep pockets like Microsoft, you could, in, uh, an, uh, an organization that also controls the compi their own compilers and so on, you could effectively build all of this infrastructure within the organization and just use that as a way to enforce these security policies. I think this kind of model is much more useful in systems where you don't want, where the organization doing the operating system, whether it's Linux or FreeBSD or whatever, doesn't want to be also having to control the, the compilers that enforce all of these properties, where you could instead rely on a, a late stage compiler that does, just a back end compiler that does the security checking for you. So let me just give you an exa uh, three examples of the uh, security policies that we've been able to enforce with this kind of system. And um, I'm just going to say a few words about them. I'd be more than happy to talk about the security policies offline if you're, if you're interested. But the first one was SVAM, which was the first system to enforce full memory safety for a complete commodity operating system. And uh, we did this for the Linux, uh, for the Linux kernel. Um, the second one is we call it coffee. It's the first system we know have to provide full control flow integrity for a complete commodity operating system. And the motivation here is that memory safety, while it's a pretty strong policy, has significantly, uh, has fairly high overhead. And many of the attacks on memory safety bugs are effectively control flow exploits. And a control flow integrity policy can prevent most of those attacks or, or all of the control flow exploits kinds of attacks. Memory safety cost to do array bounds checking? Is that what it's you mean? You mean one -time cost mostly to do array bounds checking. That's right. Yes. 
And in particular, to array bounds checking in a language that doesn't have any support for it. Because now you don't know for a pointer what object it points to and where the object begins and ends. So you have to keep a lot of additional metadata in order to do that and look that metadata up at runtime. The third policy, which is, is quite a bit more ambitious, is something we call virtual ghost. What this does is it allows a system, it allows an application to not have to trust the underlying operating system and still preserve its own confidentiality and integrity. And so even if you have a comp compromise of the operating system on which, the app, under, on which the application is running, the application's code and data can neither be read nor tampered with, or any data that it wants to protect can neither be read nor tampered with by the OS, even if the OS is hostile or compromised. And there have been previous systems that do this using hypervisors, but they have significantly higher overhead than what Virtual Ghost does. So we use uh, only compiler techniques to do uh, the, to enforce the security invariants that you need for this. And there have also been previous systems that use, or more recent systems like one called Haven, that use a custom hardware in order to enforce these kinds of policies. Uh, Virtual Ghost runs on commodity systems using only compiler techniques. So I'm not going to say anything more about the details of these systems just because of lack of time. Um, but if anyone's interested, I'd be more than happy to talk to you more about this. But the, I just want to leave you with some examples of the kind of compiler techniques that we use to enforce these security policies, just hopefully to convince you that these are difficult or, or uh, weaker to do on, on native machine code. So there are a number of techniques that we use for these security policies that I think would be inherently uh, much less precise if you were doing them on native machine code. So this includes things like call graph analysis, point analysis, type inference, escape analysis, uh, identifying low-level OS operations, and enforcing a number of restrictions on native code. And then there are other techniques that can be done effectively on machine code, but incur higher overhead, like software fault isolation and control flow enforcement, so control flow integrity. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about the security side of uh, virtual instruction sets, yeah? Okay. Um, we've talked a bit about Microsoft yes. spending millions of dollars, as somebody's pointed out, and yes. still manage to ship operating systems that have exploits in them. Yeah. Um, how can we be sure that your software, which you're using to check for security, is safer than Microsoft? You've got a much smaller team, you're not spending millions of dollars, you know, oh, of course, if there's yeah. an exploit, yeah, are yeah. You can, how are you going to be sure you're going to detect that exploit? Yeah. <laughs> I think at the end of the day, you always have um, ways in which vulnerabilities can be introduced. The one big benefit here is the trusted computing base is far, far smaller. You're not having to trust a complete OS. You're really only trusting the implementation of the SVOS library and a few compiler passes. And the SVOS library is on the order of a few thousand lines of code rather than a few hundreds of thousands of lines of code. And it does very simple things. So in fact, it can be fully, ver the implementation of it can be fully verified. So today, you, people have built special purpose operating systems that can be fully verified. But it's very difficult to, to retrofit that to existing commodity systems, the full verification. Whereas fully verifying the SVOS libraries is, is relatively straightforward, I think. Does that make sense? So you effectively, I think the ability to enforce security policies on, while trusting only SVOS, is much cheaper than having to do that for a full OS. But you still have to get the security policy right. Yes, of course. All of those requirements still exist very much. Yeah. It seems like what you're suggesting is the, the user, the end user's machine, should have the flexibility to enforce some other security policy other than the person who shipped the code. Is that right? So if, if Microsoft, for example, compiled their operating system with, with in mind that they'd like somebody to run it as fast as possible, but you are in a particular place that would like to run it, you're willing to pay a high cost for extreme security, you should have the flexibility to um, compile it and pay a 40% overhead for 
So is that kind of the benefit? And how would, if that is, then how, how would that compare to if Microsoft decided to be flexible enough to ship 100 different copies of Windows with varying um, compiler guarantees? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, but um, I think the point here is that if you can, uh, if you can add a low-level layer like SVOS to the kernel, so the compiler issues I think are a bit of a red herring here. The, the major benefits really come from the abstraction layer that SVOS provides and the runtime monitoring that SVOS provides, which Microsoft themselves would have to add to Windows or the Linux developers would have to add to Linux or whatever. And that layer is really a big part of many of the security. So for example, if you go back to uh, Virtual Ghost, right? where an application can preserve confidentiality and integrity without trusting the operating system. The compiler techniques that system uses are actually really simple. All it does is the equivalent of software fault isolation. It basically just adds XORs to loads and stores and adds some labels to branch targets. And that's something that can easily be done in a compiler and then verified later. But What's crucial there was the SVOS layer, which adds a number of essential uh, monitoring steps for things like manipulating page tables. And that is really where the big advantage comes from. Now that advantage, you're right, now what, the, what that allows end users to do is to not have to trust the entire OS. Okay. And so if the OS is compromised, they can still enforce the security of their applications. So the way I'm interpreting this is that you're saying if you take the C programming language and you add a bunch of restrictions to the C programming language, which increase its memory safety, and at the same time you add a certain number of uh, specific SVAOS primitives, which you assert are sufficient to allow you to re-implement an operating system in your new modified version of C, then the compiler only features in this in the sense that it allows you to uh, compile this new variant of C that you've invented. And then it's possible, by example, to take some existing operating systems and essentially port them into this new world, right? And in this new world, the, the properties of this new modified C language with your safety properties provide you with a certain number of safety properties, the safety properties that you're interested in with regards to memory safety. So is that a, is that a reasonable kind of way to restate what? It's not exactly because, I, so that's only sort of half true. We do not require memory safety for uh, for SVA in general or for uh, many of the safety properties. Memory safety is one policy that you can enforce using SVA. But you can take an operating system in standard C and port it to the SVOS li library and then enforce much, so other properties like control flow integrity or what's called isolated execution, which enforces application confidentiality and integrity without having to change the programming language in any sense at all. So you are having, you do have to apply some compiler techniques to the operating system itself, but you don't have to use any kind of simplified or, or restricted programming language for that. If you take up an OS and C, you can apply software fault isolation and, and control flow integrity, which are the two things that uh, Virtual Ghost also needed, for example. And as long as it's been ported to SVOS, you can get all of the security properties that we're talking about here. Does that make sense? So memory safety is not, the, is not a requirement at all. It's just one possible policy. We're not, in fact, using memory safety. And you can have quite powerful memory safety compromises and still protect the application. We should talk more offline. I can tell you some more about what this does. Okay, so um, I am pretty much out of time here. I wanted to spend some time on automated debugging, but I think in the interest of time, I should probably wrap up, right? I think that's probably the right thing to do. So let me just go to the, I don't know what slide that would be. I have lots of slides. 
on automated debugging. But let me just go to So, okay, I'm just going to give you one brief slide on the performance and, and portability work that we're doing, and then I'll get to the end of the talk. So, right now we're looking at three kinds of uh, performance and portability benefits for virtual instruction sets. One is auto tuning, and in particular, I'm, we're very interested in what kinds of, in, in how much better you could do in, in auto tuning and, auto, and empirical optimization of both kernels and full applications, if you could do it on end user machines, but do it with a rich code representation. So you could apply more sophisticated optimizations than just native machine code, but you could also do it for a particular end user machine. Um, a second one, as I said, for heterogeneous systems is that today apps cannot use all the accelerators on a mobile device without sacrificing portability for application specific code in particular. And what we'd like to be able to do is to enable both uh, using the accelerators and preserving portability. And the way we're doing that is by extending the LLVM virtual instruction set with a couple of abstractions of parallelism that can be mapped down to all of the different kinds of parallel hardware that exists in a particular uh, SOC. And there's in fact a wide range of different kinds of parallel hardware that you have to be able to uh, target. And the third uh, direction we're looking at are new contexts in which dynamic compilation could be, could give you significant benefits. And so for example, vector code generation, if you could take advantage of information at runtime, could we do significant, significantly better automatic vectorization and vector code generation for uh, application code? So these are all projects that are going on uh, in our group today. And if anybody is interested in any of these, I'd be uh, very happy to talk. I'd love to talk more about that. So I just want to leave you with um, a, a few last thoughts about this. I think there are a few myths about shipping code in virtual instruction set form. And I just want to see if we can uh, discuss them briefly. So first, a common myth is that JIT compilation is inherently, weak, inherently weaker, and so you get a performance penalty by shipping virtual instruction sets. But as I was arguing earlier, there is no fundamental reason for this. You can use a static code generator, and a just-in-time compiler or, or runtime optimization should really only be a, an opportunity to further improve performance. There should be no inherent performance penalty here. Second, doesn't this enable reverse engineering? And it is true that for uh, that, that shipping a virtual instruction set could make it easier to reconstruct source code from the shipped code. But in fact, machine code today can be reverse engineered to reconstruct source code. And there are quite sophisticated tools that help you do this. The real answer here is to use proactive code obfuscation techniques to try and obscure the behavior of the code. And in fact, there are commercial tools for languages like Java and C Sharp that do exactly this. And that's the reason why JVM and .NET bytecode is routinely used today for proprietary software. Um, a third one is, won't this kind of virtual instruction set model be too expensive for small scale devices. And um, at least to a reasonable uh, extent, this is not, I think it's not really a problem. For example, Android phones today already ship with an LLVM backend that's used for render script. And they do the translation to LLVM on the phone or tablet, the Android phone or tablet. And so modern mobile devices are perfectly powerful enough to uh, do backend compilation. Now, very, very small embedded devices may not have the power or uh, may not be, or probably not the right place to do this. But in those cases, you really should be doing it on the server side before you install the software. And the fourth one is, will system de designers ever agree on a common virtual ISA? But as I was saying earlier, you don't really need a universal virtual instruction set to be able to get all the benefits of it that I've been talking about. So. Uh, I think that's really all I have to say.
and I'm happy to take more questions. I think we can talk about test metrics. Yeah. I and mean, this is one of the problems with, I mean, well, Don already mentioned one of the big serviceability problems with .NET, but one of the other ones is the, the fact that if you do any kind of different code generation for different targets, mm -hmm. the test you know, the test matrix becomes extremely difficult. As a, certainly as a commercial software vendor where you want to actually, you know, be in a position where you have to support your customers yep, who need stuff to actually work, you now have the code that's running on their machines is not code that you're in a position to test before they bought the software. I mean, it's, it's her, a horrendous situation to be in, right? So I think this becomes a problem if the... Uh, if the back-end code generator could produce versions of software that have bugs that were different from what the back-end code generators do during testing. Effectively, when you're well, testing... Well, there's two separate issues. Okay, there is, uh, is the, does the code generator have bugs in it, which only show no, up no, in no, some that's areas? That's not what I understand. Right? Yeah, yeah. And then the separately is, does the code, because yeah. of some inherent yeah. difference in right. performance or whatever actually behave incorrectly yeah. given that it was recompiled in a different way. So I think this is a real concern and in fact um, you can test it for different architectures ahead of time using essentially the same execution environment that would generate code on the end user's machine and to the extent that you can test on different target hardware today you can test on different target hardware with the versions of the code generators that would be used later. So that would ameliorate at least the problem to some extent. So you're so, suggesting that there's kind of one statically compiled generic flavor which everybody uses and then if some particular piece of hardware is sufficiently common that the manufacturer of that piece of hardware should work in collaboration with the, the no, uh, no. software vendor to ensure that the optimized version for that back end is also tested. Is that the model? No, 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 no. sorry, no. I'm, I'm saying just that uh, only that, so if you're shipping a particular, let's say, you know, Microsoft, let's say you're shipping PowerPoint and you want to test PowerPoint for some set of architectures, some set of machines, today you would actually run on those machines in order to test the actual binary code for those machines. Test metrics is already. Yeah, uh, in the right of time. Somebody other than me, sorry. Yeah. <laughs>